What can I do for you? Oh, a little song, a little dance, Batman's head on a lance. Tell me, uh, what do you know about? I don't know anything about Batman. Really? Well, how about a little you and me? Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. I said last weekend I was going to have legendary Batman writer Chuck Dixon uh, here on Thinking Critical. And here he is. How you doing, Chuck? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Well, I want to say thank you very much. We are big Batman fans here on the channel. And uh, I do have my good friend Josh McDonald. We talk about Batman each and every week. I was like, I, I got to get Chuck Dixon on here. We got to talk some, about some Batman, get some some brass tacks. What's what's the character all about? You know, maybe some of the history. And, you know, just straight off, where, what were your big influences on Batman? Why is that character, like, is that just one of the characters that always really spoke to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, um, you know, I got I, I got involved with the, they would do these 80-page giants, and they would reprint stuff from the late 40s and through the 50s. Because uh, when I was a kid, Batman was kind of in his science fiction phase. I mean, DC was throwing every, they were throwing, you know, creatures from other planets at him and stuff like that. They were just trying to keep sales up. Uh, and uh, I didn't like the comic when I was a kid, but I loved the reprint stuff. And I really got into it. And my favorite Batman story was the the um, the strange costumes of the Batman. Uh, that story just blew my mind. Uh, and, you know, and, and everything about the character, I mean. What's not to like about Batman? And then, and then the TV show came along and kind of ruined it for me. <laughs> you didn't like the campy Adam West show? No, nah, because I was like, I think I was twelve when that came on, and uh, I remember watching the first episode and my parents were laughing at it. I'm like, they're laughing at Batman. I was just so upset. I mean, it, later on, I learned to appreciate the show. I love the show now, but at the time, it was like this isn't the Batman that I expected it to be. You think you were expecting a more serious portrayal? I hadn't seen really any Adam West Batman, so I'd seen you know the 1989 Tim Burton Batman. Oh, okay, okay. So you know you see something like that. That's really dark, you know. Especially you know I would have been 11 years old when it came out. Right. What probably one of the darker movies I've ever seen. So you see that, then you see the the Adam West one. And he's got you know shark spray and all this you know kind of crazy stuff stuff going on. So yeah, he's I was laughing around. too, but it seemed like a, a pretty funny take. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it. You know, if I was if I was six, I probably would have loved it because the show was written on two levels. You know, it was written to be laughed at by adults, and 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 you know, taken seriously by kids. I was just at the wrong age for it, and, and way too much of a Batman devotee. Uh, I was, you know, just an uber nerd about Batman, so I, you know, it displeased me. <laughs> so, did you always want it? Did you want to grow up to be a Batman writer? Is that what it always was? I never really thought about writing Batman. I wanted to write comics. I love the medium, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably love the medium more than I love the characters, and I do love the characters. But I never thought about writing Batman because everyone wants to write Batman. And I thought, well, I'm never going to get my yeah, I'm never going to get my chance. And then I got invited by Denny O'Neill to write the first Robin miniseries. Uh, it's just like out of the blue. So, and then I just never left. I mean, I was there for eleven years at DC writing. You know, tons of Batman stuff. Absolutely, you were. You pretty much wrote the whole family. You created obviously yeah. created a lot of great characters. Stephanie Brown, Bane, among others. Is there is there something specific about like st the street level heroes? Obviously, the Batman family, Batman, Nightwing. You know, uh, you know, Stephanie Brown, Tim Drake, whatnot. Those are all kind of street level characters. Also, your Punisher work is obviously really well known. Is there is there something? Do you did you always gravitate to the non powered heroes that were operating in the universes? Well, I was fine with writing, you know, the cosmic stuff and all that. I mean, I did a little bit of that, but um, I just, you know, you get typecast. Uh, yeah. And I guess I was good at it. I mean, my I tend to try to ground my work in some sort of reality, even if I've created the reality myself so that it's consistent. And uh, I just sort of, and, you know, I'm a big Punisher fan, so I guess, you know, I was attracted to that initially. But, yeah, and I'm willing to do the homework on, you know, all the logistics of stuff. I mean, I love thinking about when we redesigned the Batmobile, what it would be. I mean, nobody else cared, but I wanted to know what engine it had in it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, all this other stuff, you know, so, so I guess I'm attracted more to that, that kind of character. And, and plus it's, 
the attraction of Batman is is that you know you could be Batman. I mean, if you put the work yeah. in, you could be Batman. Yeah, other people weren't weren't thinking if I was going to create a Batmobile, what would it have to be able to do? Oh yeah, what would it have to be able to survive? You know, how fast would it need to go? That'd be the fun part. Because the Batmobile creates so many questions. You know, yeah. what if he it's what if he got character. what if he got stuck in traffic? How does he park it and just leave it? I did a whole issue where the Batmobile defends itself. He parks yeah. it, leaves it to go off on an adventure, and the rest of the story is the Batmobile, you know, kicking the ass of anybody who came near it. And um, you know, you know, creating a car for Robin, creating a car for for Nightwing, stuff like that. I mean, the subway rocket that Graham Nolan and I created, so Batman could you know travel on the subway tracks, stuff like that. I, just, I loved, I loved thinking about all that kind of stuff. Man, speaking of Graham Nolan, working on Batman, you know, you're the, the flagship of DC Comics, you get to work with the best artists. That certainly has got to help your your reputation within comics to really get more gigs. You get to work with Graham Nolan and those likes. Well, the thing is, I mean, I was friends with Graham because we had worked. I had done some of. I had written some of his earliest comic work, and um, and when we were losing our Batman artist at the time, Mike Mike Netzer, um, they were like, "Well, who, who are we going to get?" And I said, "Let's get Graham Nolan." And all of the editors are like, "Oh, we don't know if he's right for Batman." And I'm like, the guy is Batman. He knows more about Batman than anybody alive. He's got a huge golden age Batman collection. And he is so into this character, you know, you know, he's going to do an amazing job, which, which he did. You know, I, I convinced them. I, I had enough juice in the Batman offices that they said, okay, well, we'll use him on a few issues. You know, and then he stuck with me for what, you know, 50, 60 issues. Absolutely. That was, that was a good call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's uh, Graham's like, and, you know, well, he's just a, he's a great guy, and he's so much fun to work with. And like I said, we were friends, so and he killed it on Batman. He just did fantastic work. Absolutely. Was, I don't know if you, I, I don't know if you read a lot of modern DC comics. No, not a whole lot. <laughs> hey, I, I don't blame you. It, it's difficult sledding going through some of these comics, but right now, over like half of all of DC's titles. Are either led by Batman, it's Batman, you know, in a team book, or led by Batman related characters. Yeah. We're talking upwards of like 38, sometimes 40 comic books, new comics in a month, Batman comic or Batman related. I know you love Batman, but doesn't that feel like overkill? Yeah, yeah. They're definitely going back to the well too often. Uh I, I remember the the last Batman summit I was at. On the last day, the Superman group editor came over to tell us what they had talked about at the Superman Summit. And their their idea was is that Superman gets amnesia and he thinks he's Batman. And so for six months, Superman's running around as Batman in the Superman comics. And I'm like, that's going to be like 10 comics a month with Batman in them. It's Just one, of them one of them is going to be Clark Kent instead of Bruce Wayne. And I said, this is crazy. You know. Paul Levitz was in charge of DC at the time. I said, this is never going to fly when you talk to him. And, and it didn't. <laughs> he, no, it was, he was like, three days, and this is what you came up with? Superman thinks he's Batman? <laughs> it'd be a funny, like, one-shot, maybe? Like, yeah, you need yeah. a little palate cleanser after a big story. But yeah. Exactly. But Six no, they months, wanted, that's insane. They, they wanted to the milk it. They, basically, they wanted a piece of the Batman sales. <laughs> and that's what they're doing now. They're just spreading the character thinner and thinner and thinner over the whole line. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's almost like there's no Batman stories to tell because they've they've used a character up so much. Well, there's Obviously, plenty of stories to tell, trust me. There's plenty more stories to tell. It's just, you know, they just don't, they're creatively bankrupt, as I had mentioned before we went on the air. It's If they were smart, if they know Batman sells. If they, at least it's an experiment. Try like one big honking Batman magazine a month that you can charge like, you know, 12 bucks for and just put everything in there instead of trying to, you they know, they have nickel, like three anthologies. I'm with you. They should make one anthology with all three of them in there. Yeah. Just boom. Just stick that and see what happens. I'm, I swear I would have to sell better than what they're doing now and, 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 you know, be a better deal certainly for the fans. Yeah, it's crazy. They wanted to uh, up up price the Batman regular series to six dollars. Uh, there was enough pushback they had to push it back down to five dollars. Well, what are they like it, twenty? What are they like twenty pages now? Yeah, well, there's a backup story, so it ends up being thirty two. But still, I'm not reading the backup story. I want to read the Batman story. I don't want to read exactly. whatever 
crabs in the back. But the Joker story is six bucks. The the Joker wow. story where you got Jim Gordon chasing down the Joker, trying to kill him in Europe. Wow. Well, that's all because of low sales. I mean, they, <clears throat> they have to charge yes. more. As the sales go down, they have to charge more for each issue, which is sad. Because yeah. so, yeah, when, when, when I was at CrossGen, I, uh, I was involved with marketing for Free Comic Book Day, and we were going to release a brand new. We were going to start a series on a, with a Free Comic Book Day. So it was going to be all new material. And um, the sales were so high on it because, I mean, dirty little secret, the retailers pay for those comics. They're mm-hmm. not free to the retailer. And I think yes. they were like 19 cents a piece. And the orders were so high on it that it was going to be our most profitable book that month at, for at 19, 19 cents a piece. And I'm like, why can't they bring the price down? Why can't they do stuff that sells more so they can make these things cheaper so you know kids could actually buy them? That's crazy. And somebody with some kids, I wish uh, wish there were DC and Marvel comics with these superheroes that I love that I actually give to my kids. Right, right. Even the stuff that's like supposedly made for them, there's so many weird things in there. I have to read them before I can actually hand them over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. you can't trust it anymore. You can't trust no. it. You know, just because it has Superman or Batman in it, that it's going to be okay for the kiddies. That's yeah. sad. Very sad. It is. Yeah, back in the day, you, you know, you get like a little story and it would have like, a you know, don't lie to your parents. You should always be honest. Stand up right. for your friend. You know, some type of universal message in there. But yeah, those exactly. days are long gone. No, no. It's all dark, dismal, nihilistic and perverse. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It, Frederick Wortham was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's another conversation <laughs> that we might have to have another time. What I've noticed a lot with like the mainline Batman comics, you know, the characters spread thin. And as you said, there are plenty of stories, new stories to tell, but it feels like they're just like kind of in a rut telling the same stories. Like in the past, I don't know, less than two years, Gotham City has been taken from from Bruce Wayne and it's, you know, drove him to his lowest point. And it's just like it's it's a weird they're taking different angles with the character. I remember when I read Nightfall. And you obviously introduced the character of Bane, who's been, you know, kind of planning or he's had a sight set on Gotham and Batman specifically, you know, to, to kind of go out there and, and prove that the Batman can't con- overcome all. He concocts a big plan. He releases all the villains out there. And basically, because Batman is a heroic character and he can't leave Gotham to fend for itself, he runs himself into the ground, leaves himself very vulnerable and is defeated. So he used his heroic nature against him, and that's how the character is brought to his lowest point. Right. You know, it wasn't because uh, you know he was scared or he wasn't uh, qualified or he wasn't competent or whatever. Right. He just couldn't stop on his mission to save people. He was just overworked. Yeah. 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 He he left himself vulnerable because he he couldn't leave the city like that. We got like a, a similar story. Obviously, it was it's also including Bane recently and uh, Tom King. Not my favorite Batman writer, but he also wanted to take Batman to his lowest point. But instead of like using the heroic nature of the character and using the story to highlight that Batman is a hero, he's he's such a hero he almost kill himself trying to save Gotham. You know he you know the re, the way he brings him down to his lowest point is his girlfriend breaks up with him, and he essentially <laughs> she leaves him at the altar. And he he can't he can't uh, he's unfunctional at this point and he can no longer protect Gotham. And at one point he's he's left. He's on Hawaii making things right with Selena because she's the one that left him. Gotham right. is overtaken by Bane and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Flashpoint Batman. And he actually sends David Wayne into Gotham to save Alfred. And of course, <laughs> Alfred is murdered in front of Damien while. Bruce Wayne Batman is on the beaches of Hawaii banging his girlfriend. It's like, this is the most unheroic character I've ever seen in my life. I mean, basically, I mean, I was brought into uh, the Batman camp, basically, because they they, they just lost the writer. Uh, Denny had to finally fire Peter Milligan because he was incapable of writing a hero. Uh, he didn't understand how heroes work. And, uh, you know, so they brought me in. I mean, and so now they're back to that, you know, where he's unheroic. I mean, the idea that he'd be so torn up over 
a, a girlfriend leaving him. I mean, this is a guy who saw his mur parents murdered as a child. You think this guy has a heart of stone at this point? You know that like, he's not going to carry around you know any recent emotional baggage. You know his baggage cart is full. <laughs> it yeah, just doesn't make any sense. He's devoted to the mission. I, yeah, one hundred percent. Oh, it it to just see the character fail like. Prior to that event, I, I don't want to. I'm bringing up old stuff, stuff that makes me mad. We've we've got a there's a wedding happening, and it's leading up to the Batman wedding where he doesn't get married. We we've got this couple; they're about to get married. Joker comes in there because he's upset that he wasn't invited to the Batman wedding, <laughs> and he storms this thing. Batman arrives to stop him. Batman's standing three feet away from Joker. Joker pulls up a gun, shoots the bride right in the face, right in front of it. Batman does nothing. And then Joker grabs a hostage. Well, maybe he had already done that, but he ends up holding himself hostage. He puts a gun to his his set his head, and makes Batman pray with him before he shoots Batman himself in the head. Of course, he's got his cowl on so he doesn't die. Right. You're like, who is this character? Like, he just let him murder this woman right in front of him. And he, there was no repercussions. He didn't even respond. Yeah. See, I, I mean. Ever since Killing Joke, you know, the way they treat Batman and Joker's relationship is, is you know, I don't know. It doesn't work for me. I, it, it, when, when I was writing Batman, you know, I would introduce the Joker in stories. You, you have to write a good Joker story because everybody remembers if you wrote a bad one. So you know, <laughs> I had to work extra hard on Joker stories to make sure they were special when they would meet. But Batman took a lot of joy in either physically abusing Joker or <laughs> <clears throat> mentally abusing him. Because, I mean, I wrote a lot of stories where Joker visits, or Batman visits Joker in Arkham just to mess with his head uh, and always succeeds. In my, Batman always won out in mind. Joker never got the upper hand on Batman because, you know, what's the point of having the hero character? You know, and for Batman to do nothing while someone else is being murdered, I mean, that's, yeah, I, it, it's... You know, again, creatively bankrupt. And, and when you describe the plot of that story, it, it sounded like a filmation cartoon from the 70s, you know, <laughs> like remade by Quentin Tarantino. It's, like <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the damnedest thing when you see the way that the, the character is portrayed nowadays as if he's incapable of, of saving people. And I'm with you. The way that the joker Batman <clears throat> relationship, um, I don't know, I think I kind of think it started kind of with Frank Miller where it's, you know, Joker's in love with Batman and yeah. he doesn't, he wants to have all of his attention and it upsets him if, if somebody else gets attention away from, uh, from Joker for Batman. I like the one where Joker's the ultimate wild card. You never know why he's doing what he's doing. When right. you think about like the story, the Joker fish, if you read that, when yeah. that's introduced, that is nuts. Right. He's just, he wants to. Uh, you know, get a trademark on Joker fish. Like, what right. the hell does this come from? Right. And if you're not going to do the trademark fast enough, he'll murder you. And yeah, <laughs> it's just so weird. You wouldn't. You or I could never understand why the character would want to do that. But it makes sense for Joker, and it makes him the ultimate foil because you can't predict what he's going to do. Yeah, well, I mean, when I first came on board with the Batman stuff, you know, you read the stuff and you're a fan, but you understand quickly that writing it is a whole different game. You know, now I got to think of new stuff. Now I've got to have a far deeper understanding of how these characters work. And I remember saying to Scott Peterson, one of my editors at the time, I said, well, you know, wh what's your opinion on Joker? And he said, the Joker reinvents himself every morning. And I said, that's what I'm, that's how I'm going to write it. And, you know, that nails it. You know, but to make him this, you know, I don't know, like he's in love with Batman. He's like a fanboy. He's like yeah. an obsessed fan or something. I mean, I mean, when I was a kid, Joker would plan these crimes <clears throat> and was upset when Batman showed up. <laughs> I mean, he wanted the crime to be successful. You know, and Batman was always ruining it. So, yeah, he was angry with Batman. He was resentful toward Batman because he was always the loser in every encounter. And, and that's the relationship. He's not in love with him. He's not obsessed with him. If, if, you know, in, my, in, in my world, you know, the, you know, ideally, the Joker would never see Batman again. Yeah, I remember, I think it's a Denny O'Neill story where there's a villain that has a good plan and they're going to kill Batman. 
I think they no, they've identified it's Bruce Wayne. They're going to tell the world, right? And uh, they bring all the criminals together because I think maybe they're going to sell his identity out. And as soon as Joker finds out that somebody's figured out who he is and it's going to ruin their game, he ends up murdering him and anyone else that knows who Batman is. I always thought that was kind of a cool twist too. Yeah, that's where a, at that's that a point good is in his career, right? It's it, it's just a game to him. He needs somebody right. out there to try and stop him. Otherwise, he's got no one to play with. See, that's the perfect example of writing a story. I mean, these characters have you know, been around forever. Coming up with new stories isn't easy. That's a perfect example of working within the framework to come up with a brand new story. You know, brand new plot lines never been used. Because they're it's out, out there. Out of nowhere. You wouldn't have expected it. Right. At that right. point. But it's brilliant. What? It's brilliant. <laughs> it is. I got my hats off, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but that's what I mean. When you think about these characters, and you think about the logistics, you think about the stories grow out of those things. It grows out of all the questions you have to ask about the characters because they're these are superhero characters. They're at the, at the, the bottom of it all. all the, and the characters are basically ridiculous. But if you start examining them, all these great stories grow out of it. I grow out mm-hmm. of it, especially at DC. DC's DC's core appeal is the goofiness of the whole universe. And, you know, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's kind of a, it's a fun, it, and that's what they've done. They've sucked all the fun out of it. It's not goofy anymore. It's just depressing and dismal. Yeah, they've, they've sucked the fun and the hope simultaneously out of the entire universe. The yeah, two I mean, real selling points. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a you know, a dark Avenger of the night whose greatest villain is a clown. <laughs> and, a, yeah. and, a, and a guy who, who carries an umbrella and calls himself the penguin. I mean, it's like, you've got to lean into that, you know, to make these comics fun. And uh, they don't see the one to make them fun anymore. What do you, what part of this do you think is like an editorial thing? Obviously you, you've mentioned Danny O'Neill a few times, fantastic writer, one of the best writers in comic history. Also one of the greatest editors in comic history, like the, yeah. the best runs in Batman essentially happened under Denny O'Neill's stewardship as the, you know, the group editor is the kind of overseer. And you see different takes on Batman. Do you think it's, it's, you have to have somebody with a strong understanding of the character that can help, help guide the writers or maybe keep them in bounds within the DC universe? Well, I mean, I, I described every editor after Denny O'Neill as indifferent. I didn't seem to really care. You know, it was just something they were just getting up in the morning and making the donuts. Uh, Denny was into it. I mean, um, I mean, Denny's a guy who started out as a journalist. He wanted to be a novelist. You know, he didn't make it at either succeeded in comics, but didn't, but never looked down on them. He thought, okay, well, if this is what I meant to do, I'm going to do it right. You know, and he, he saves Batman from campiness. You know, he, he, he reboots Batman in the seventies and saves him for all of us. And, you know, he was totally into it. Every editor I had after he retired, it was like, yeah, they could have been editing The Flash. They really didn't care, you know. And so they just sort of let the creative end run wild, you know. And and I was still following the Denny rules <laughs> because there were mm-hmm. rules. You know, there was an essay. It was like a 10-page Bat Bible. And, and I kept following that because it made sense to me. You know, but everybody else was off on their own thing. And, and we see now, you know, with an indifferent editor and creators left to their own devices, you know, we're at the end of the road now, you know, yeah, because, crazy. because they go darker and darker and darker. And there's no the, the, the end of the end of the road for going darker and darker and darker is is perversity because <laughs> that's because then you got to get you know weird and you got to get fetishistic and strange. And it's like there's no there's no end to it. And it's like, this is not good. This is not good for the franchise. It was, it's crazy under Denny O'Neill. Obviously, you have uh, these really wonderful classic takes on the character that really developed who Batman was. But you had these other things happen, you know, Dark Knight Returns, the killing joke that you mentioned, mentioned earlier. But you could tell those were never, ever supposed to seep into Batman Kane. And those were supposed to no. be Elseworlds right. held tightly at, you know, at an arm's distance. You can right. go read this other weirder version of Batman that's a little bit darker, you know, more adult kind of kind of stuff. Right. But for some reason, because those stories became popular and kind of iconic, they decided to let it seep into the mainline continuity. And it really has perverted the character in the in the universe, in Gotham itself. Well, you had a lot of writers come along afterwards. Uh, 
um, who were influenced by what Alan Moore and Frank Miller did. And they thought that's the ultimate Batman. And they weren't interested in writing Batman for kids or Batman for a general audience. And, um, you know, so they just, you know, I mean, Alan Moore, I, I, Alan Moore is a terrific writer, but he's been a malign influence on comic book writing. Because yes. like, like mm -hmm. after him, like his scripts made the rounds. People would have Xeroxes of his scripts. And so people coming into the industry after him thought, well, you write comics the way Alan Moore did. You know, and so I had artists complaining to me about these densely written, you know, 60 page scripts for a 20 page story. And, and it's like, well, it's, it's Alan Moore influence. It's they're not letting you tell the story because the, the, to me, the artist has to be a partner. He's the one carrying the story. He's telling the story visually and you're there to aid him, set him up and aid him along the way. And uh, Alan Moore's, you know, an auteur, you know, and, and unfortunately that's the direction it took. I mean, I can't tell you how many meetings and lunches I was at where newbie writers were suggesting we should have an adult line of Batman comics, you know? Well, we do like, now. It's called I, they the black now. label. They do now. And I was like, that's a horrible idea. These characters are still, you know, on, you know, pajamas and <laughs> you know, absolutely. You go to any kid's figures. aisle. Exactly. I go to I go to buy backpacks and everything. There's more there's more DC backpacks than there are Marvel still because the the Batman logo, the Superman logo, right? They, they still reign supreme. People all over the world knows what know what these things are specifically. Children. Yeah, I mean they they pollute they they pollute the franchise. I I, I mean I remember it, meeting with Denny and I think Jeanette Kahn at one of the summits, and and in just an idle conversation, I said, you know you you people really should think about pushing that Batman logo as a, as a gimmick, as a marketing tool beyond the comics, just sell the Batman logo on everything, which Absolutely. they did. They ended up, I don't know if it's because of what I said, but all of a sudden it's everywhere. You know? Yeah. They made DC comics, not DC comics, obviously Warner media who owned DC comics, I believe in 2018 made more money off licensing their logos. 1.5 billion dollars substantially more than the entire comic book industry in north america yep yep it's, yeah it's, uh, you know it, it, and it, it's, it's not hard to see why i mean everybody's got something with batman or superman yeah yeah it's it's uh, it's crazy what, what do you think about diddy o'neill like what kind of loss is it that we don't have those kind of editors anymore that that dc comics does it bring in a, a Chuck Dixon or somebody else that's worked within the DC universe and understands what Gotham is and the mechanics of a Batman comic? You know, it does feel like the writers in a lot of times are left to their own devices. We know, you know, Tom King got upset with his original editor who had been very successful with Scott Snyder beforehand and got him fired Yeah, because, uh, you know, was it one of the artists that he wanted to do a, a cover for him? was on vacation. He said, no, I'm not going to bother while he's on vacation. We'll get another artist. He said, that's not the right answer. He got him fired and got his own own editor put in place. Now, can you imagine firing the guy who hired you? <laughs> I mean, that's just, that goes against every law in comics. You know, I mean, I, I remember Larry Hama, uh, creator of all the G.I. Joe stuff. I worked with Larry mm -hmm. a lot when I was at Marvel. And a bunch of editors were complaining about an an editor in chief, you know, and they were calling him all kinds of names and everything else. And they turned to Larry and says, you know, you're not saying anything. You have more reason to dislike him than anybody. And he said, well, he hired me, <laughs> you know, boss. and, and I've made all this money because he hired me. You know, I owe him that respect, you know, even though I disagree with him from time to time, I'm not going to stand here and, you know, gossip like a bunch of hens with you guys. And um, so that's, you know, I, I can't believe somebody would get their editor fired. That just seems like the most disloyal thing imaginable. Over over which artist you wanted? I mean, you know, you're not the cover boss. artist. Cover artist. Cover artist. I mean, there, was... I mean, there was a lot of cover artists I had I didn't like, but and I let them know I didn't like them, but I wasn't about to go any further than saying. No, this is this is a really this highly sought public. after cover artist. He was on vacation. He's like, no, he's not available. He's out. <laughs> he's out for two weeks. That's that's so nuts. I, I, I remember my, my last my last years on Batman after Denny left. Um, I I forget what title. I think I was still doing Nightwing and Robin. And the main Batman editor told me that 
his his Batman writers were on strike. They were upset about something, and they weren't handing in their work. And I said, I couldn't believe what he said. I was like, what? <laughs> how does that work? Are you the boss? How, how did, or not? Yeah. It's, I said, why don't you fire them? And I says, I'll write all three titles until you find a find new writer. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. And you know what the funniest thing is, is when uh, Mark Doyle, the editor that I'm talking about, when DC did their first round of firings during the after the pandemic, when they opened up back up, when Mortar Media was kind of cutting, uh, cutting some of the fat. Obviously, he was one of the ones that got. You know, so it was, it was Mark Doyle. I liked Mark Doyle. He was. Yeah, guy. he was the one that Tom King got fired. And when he when he got released by DC Comics, Tom King said you're like we're going to be missed you're you're professional like, <laughs> you might have been the reason that he got fired oh my god yeah mark doyle mark doyle was not indifferent he, he was a good editor man oh man that's that's that crazy good? i you know i don't know why they don't bring people back as consultants i mean certainly i would consult on batman if i was paid i wouldn't want to edit it <clears throat> you know you wouldn't want to be the main man behind all 40 batman comics you know, Denny offered me the group editorship before he retired. He, he told me, he says, I'm going to be retiring like in six months. He says, would you consider being group editor? And I said, I, I couldn't take the pay cut. And he goes, I, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> the pay cut and having to move to the New York area. I was like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> yeah, you would like Peter J. Tomasi was an editor at DC for, for a while before he moved over to the writer's side. It's like. They need somebody like that that just gets the characters and gets the universe. Yeah. Like, there's just. Yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah. It, well, the problem is, is editors and creators, a lot of them are careerists and it's not a career in comics. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're looking like, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to work here for a while and it's going to look really cool that DC comics is on my resume. But mm -hmm. you know, now I want to go work at, you know, Vanity Fair or MTV <laughs> Someplace like that, you know, uh, I want to go into the music business. I, I remember Dan DiDio came from uh, music mm -hmm. and TV, and all of the people he brought with him were from music. And they didn't know anything about comics. Uh, I, I, my, brief, my brief return to um, DC to write <clears throat> Batman and the Outsiders, uh, I was in the offices, and I asked the, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the current continuity changes because I hadn't been there for a while. And they said, well, we have a continuity guy. So I go in his office and he's playing on his iPod. <laughs> he's programming his iPod. And uh, he has nothing in his office. There's no art on the walls or anything else. I'm like, okay, this guy's not a comic guy. They go, who's your favorite character? I have no idea. Right, right. <laughs> and I said, you know, uh, what about this character? Dan wants me to use this character. What, what about this character? And he reaches up to these bound copies of the who's who. DC <laughs> and gets it down, starts looking through it. Like their own version of Wikipedia that's hard copy. And, and I said, "You're you're uh, you're the continuity guy, huh?" And we, I mean, we used to have Peter Sanderson. You could just walk up to him in the hallway and say, "Hey, tell me about this character," and he just <laughs> tell you everything about that character. I know about four guys that would be great continuity guys at DC. Yeah. Know every character, know all the history. They probably don't even have that position anymore. Nah, so. I, I imagine not. Not from what I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> So, Chuck, obviously, we, we talked plenty about Batman. There's a few other things I wanted to get into. Um, most of the people on the channel will know. Batman's not my favorite character in the Bat family. My favorite character is actually Dick Grayson. Cool. In my opinion, you have written the best Dick Grayson comics, whether they are Robin or they are Nightwing. Which one is the better version of the character? Is it the Robin version of Dick Grayson or the Nightwing? Which one was the better one to write? Um... I, I liked writing Nightwing because he's, you know, you had the challenge of writing the character, you know, I mean, I realized he'd been Nightwing, other people had written him and stuff like that, but, but he, you know, I was writing it for the first time in, in ongoing solo adventures, mm -hmm. so I had to think, you know. First time as Robin and as Nightwing. Right, right. So I'm like, you know, my main thing was I don't want him to be Batman Jr. <laughs> it's like. He's, he's, he's not a carbon copy of Batman at all. He's completely different. So I thought about his, his past and everything else about how, you know, he, he was a natural, you know, yes. um, Batman learns to be Batman, but, but Dick Grayson is a natural. He's already athletic, acrobatic, all this stuff. He already, he's already, he's already a disciplined athlete by the time he becomes Robin. And then by the time he becomes Nightwing, he's, he's seen what, 
being Batman has done to Bruce Wayne. And he's determined that's not going to happen to him. He's going to be a regular guy. You know, he's going to live a regular life when he's not Nightwing. And um, try to, you know, and I did little things like, you know, he speaks far more casually than Batman does. You know, he, he uses a lot of gaunas and gaunas, things like that. Uh, I figured he had, you know, uh, he picked up an accent somewhere along the line, whatever accent that would be in my head. But he wasn't like, you know, he wasn't. And, and also he, you know, like Catwoman, he's a character who, who likes himself. He's comfortable in his own skin. You know, he had the same traumatic background, childhood trauma that, that Bruce Wayne had, but he's gotten over it a lot better. So, I've heard so those Kyle are Higgins, all the things going into it. Kyle Higgins explained in, in his mind, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne as Batman is fueled by vengeance for his parents, whereas Dick Grayson as Nightwing is is fueled by his love for his parents that he's lost. And that's right. why you get the two different perspectives on the characters where you have one might be a little bit more emotionally healthy at Dick Grayson. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 a good summation. You know. Right. Cool. I don't know what what is your thoughts? Is is there do you have a favorite between Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne? Um well Dick Grayson's easier to write. Uh because Bruce Bruce doesn't talk a lot. So when he does talk, it's gotta be impactful. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be either be impactful or unintentionally funny. Yes. <laughs> That's, those are my favorites. When he's or, when he does a one liner, doesn't mean to. Yeah, or something you're gonna remember. You know, mm-hmm. because, you know, he's he's like Clint Eastwood, you know. Well, everybody remembers Clint Eastwood lines because, well, he only has like six in every movie. So, yeah, you're going to – so the writers make sure, okay, these are good lines. Every one is a gem. So, yeah, it's it's tougher to write Batman. Not to say it's not a whole lot of fun. I mean, I, I enjoy the challenge. But, yeah, Nightwing's easier to write because he seems more like a regular guy. Yeah, I think he's the most relatable character in comics. A lot of people will argue with me. They're like, no, it's Spider-Man. It's like, well, I never had spider powers when I was a teenager, but I can see <laughs> myself kind of being, you know, Dick Grayson. You're pretty talented. You're confident with your own abilities, but, you know, right. you want to have a regular life. I don't want to be just Nightwing. He wants to be Dick Grayson, too. Yeah, yeah. Peter Parker, I mean, when I was an adolescent, I I sympathized with Peter Parker because, you know, felt like he was going through stuff I was going through, but you know, as you get older, you realize what a you know sad sack he is. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick Grayson is never that. Spider Man, yeah. Every time he tries to do something good, like the worst thing happens. Right, right. Yeah. I think after a while, he just well, he has given up. How many times has he given up? He's given up a few times. <laughs> a few times. <laughs> I know a lot of writers say that uh, when they're writing characters, they'll have like an actor's voice in their head. Mark Pellegrini specifically talks about that. Like, did you have an actor's voice in your head when you were writing Dick Grayson's dialogue? No, nah, I don't. I don't. I don't. Th- every writer thinks differently. I, I. I never. I never thought that way. I, I. You know, the only time I've ever done that was I wrote a character called Skywolf when I first started in comics, and uh, in my head, it was my dad's voice because he was an older character. He was a guy in the sixties uh. uh, when I was writing him. So. But yeah, I, you know, I know a lot of writers do that. I don't. I mean, everybody write, writes different. I mean, I know writers who write complete biographies of every character they introduce. It's like, okay, well, that if that works for you, that's great. You know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just uh, for some reason it's it's a Dick Grayson Nightwing for me. I I, I like Batman. Wow. The whole Bat family is great, but that's the one character I just think is is the best. He's was clearly like, the 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 next in line for the mantle, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that, that's why you know we frustrated so many fans in Nightfall. You know why? Why didn't he? Why did he pick this? You know, weirdo. Absolutely. Instead of picking, it? well, that was the point of it because he, he had to fail. Wrong, yeah, he picks the wrong guy. You know, yes. uh, that was the whole point of it. And then we get to show the readers. You know, uh, yeah, you don't want a vengeful, uh, lethal Batman because this is what he would be like. And, you know, we finally, I think, convinced most of the readership at the time that, yeah, they didn't want the Batman they thought they wanted. And then and then we brought Dick Grayson in for Prodigal at the end. It's like a little... Yes, you know, I remember that part. I was like, oh, Dick Grayson finally returns. We're going to have yeah. a little apology. Oh, I yeah. made a mistake. It should have been you. Well, I yeah. thought you didn't want to do this. Well, of course I would have stepped in for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we, you know, we did the fan service there. And that was fun to write, too. So. Yeah. It's such a it's such a cool dynamic between the two characters. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just endless the stuff you can do with it. It's just terrific stuff. And, and you know, it's it, it, it's it's not easy, but it's easier to write this stuff when it's 
you know, these classic iconic characters that everybody loves. So when you're writing it, everybody's rooting for you to do a good job. You know, they want yeah. to see you succeed at writing it. And that that's kind of, uh, I never took that for granted. I think we're in a different era in comic books. I don't think everybody wants everyone to succeed anymore. No. no like, uh, think about um, Way of Rat when that you wrote for CrossGen. I don't think that you would they would be able to hire you to write that character. And if they did in today's market, I think people would lose their minds because you're not Asian. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that <laughs> deal came along. I, I first got hired at CrossGen. And they said, we're working on a deal with a Chinese telecom company, so we need a, a, a martial arts comic, an Asian martial arts comic as part of the line. <laughs> so that's how Wave the Rat came about. And they I wanted like something. That book is pretty cool. I loved writing it. I loved writing it. I, uh, but, you know, I had to argue a lot with Mark Alessi, who ran CrossGen, because um, I, I wanted to make it a Jackie Chan movie, uh, you know, where it's funny sometimes. And when I put the monkey in, as the sigil bearer. He's like, but I wanted a beautiful girl to be the sigil bearer. I said, you've got all these other beautiful girls that are sigil bearers. I mean, who gives a crap? I want this alcoholic monkey as his sidekick. And of course, after a while, he fell in love with the character. But but it, it was fun because I, I worked with Jeff Johnson and Jeff Johnson is a practicing martial artist himself. Uh, he spent a lot of time in, in Asia. So uh, he, he gave that book such an incredible look. Uh, but you know, it, but it was a book that couldn't have been done outside of the cross gen system because we were all working together in the same facility. We were sharing the same reference. We were able to have regular meetings about the book and everything else. And that's, I think that's why it turned out so well. It feels kind of crazy. Obviously, we were talking about editorial now, and um, I think that a lack of good editorial services kind of across the board are really impacting the stories we're getting, but they're all, their hands are also kind of tied behind their back. If you're an editor going to hire for a book called, you know, way of the rat, you, you have this, you know, pool of a thousand writers, right. maybe 50 of them work for your company at that time. So you're now into 50 and then three of them are Asian. So now you're the only three, three writers that could even write the character anymore. What if none of them have the right pitch? Like they're, they're really putting themselves in a hard place by kind of casting writers to match the the racial identity or ethnic identity of the characters nowadays. It, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. Well, you know, or sexual preference or yeah. whatever other box you want to check. You know, you know, if it's a lesbian character, we want a lesbian to write it. I mean, it, this is this is crazy. This, I mean, well, it's it's all across corporate America. I mean. Is it Delta Airlines that's going to start quoting their pilots? You know, we need a certain number that are women, a certain number that are minorities, a certain number that are transgender, a certain number that are gay. I don't want to be flying on that plane. If those are the criteria, all I want to know is can, can the guy fly a plane? Was the, I don't was care. It the best pilot available on the yeah, day that you were Yeah, in. him, her, they, I don't care. But can they fly? Do they have the requisite hours? And, it, and can they fly that plane competently? I really don't. And, you know, if that turns out to be it's a majority of them are white guys, well, then fix the system leading up to that. You know, encourage more minorities and more women to become pilots through education and everything else. But you just don't change the game in the middle. This is insane. And that's what you're seeing in comics where you have to be, you know, associated. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, at Arctunes, I'm doing My Sister Suprema. It's about a Latino family a brother and sister living in central florida you know i'm not latino i live in central florida but i'm not i'm not latino you know and i i only wrote it that way and i created it years ago you know before all this nonsense i just thought it was an interesting setting and an interesting array of characters you know that had hadn't been seen up to that point you know yeah do you think about your your, your career even at dc you're the one that put birds of prey together one of the coolest yeah kind of female superhero teams that you're going to see in any comic universe you wouldn't yeah. be allowed to do that today it's no. insane well i i introduced the first practicing muslim character you know not just oh he's he's wearing a turban no this guy had a prayer mat and you know faced mecca and all that stuff and he was but he was a three-dimensional character with a family and a sense of humor and all the rest of it and, and, you know, I guess I wouldn't be allowed to do that today either. And, yeah. and I didn't do it for diversity, you know, diversity. 
I did it because, you know, these are these are stories with urban settings. They have to reflect the populace that lives in an urban setting. So there'd be a little bit of everybody, you know, because that's, I mean, I grew up in Philadelphia. It was everybody, all kinds of people there. And I was like, well, that's what a city is. You know, it's all kinds of people. And I just thought, you know, I want to reflect that reality. It wasn't a higher political purpose or agenda. Well, but I, but yeah, I was always careful when I introduced a minority character that, that they were more than just about their minority, that there was something else that was interesting about them. Well, yeah, because you wouldn't you wouldn't write Dick Grayson or Bruce Wayne like that where their defining character was that they were white. Yeah, yeah, where they just... That would be know, a pretty boring character. Yeah, you know, just, it's you know, the trauma. <laughs> it's the mission. They were just putting mayonnaise on everything all the time. You know? Yes. <laughs> 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 My goodness! And, and taking up golf, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's just it would ruin the ruin the character. Well, it's just make them flat and boring, like most yeah. you know token characters are. They're just flat, yeah. boring. There's nothing else there, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I was on Batman and the Outsiders, I mean, I joined it, and the the team was already in place because they had all the covers done for the first four mm. issues. So I had to write the characters that were on the cover, and there were there was a, a lesbian couple were part of. The Batman Outsiders, and I had a lot of fun writing them. You know, like these like cute scenes with them together. You know, either arguing or or something like that. Because mm-hmm. I, I had a lesbian aunt, and I knew all about arguing. <laughs> 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 so that, that is, that, but the thing is, I'm I'm trying to bring more to these characters that was there before than that. Oh, they're just two lesbians. It's like, well, that's not interesting. Oh, you know, let, let's 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 get some conflicts and resolution and character growth. Yeah, That's let's give about, them, right. Let's give them actual personalities that are different yeah. from one another. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, you know. I know you're the you're the creator of Bane. I don't know. If, I, you have to know this, but they have, of course, you have to have a new version of every uh, character nowadays. That uh, you know, so you've got Lady Bane. I believe yeah. the character's name actually yes. is Vengeance, right? And it feels like there has to be a, a race, gender, or sexuality swap or a new version to kind of uh, represent other communities for every single character, whether it's Superman, Batman, even Bane. Like, Bane's a pretty diverse character. Yes. Yeah. Why would you have to replace him? I, I don't understand the replacement because he serves an indelible purpose in the Batman universe is that he's a character who could if the circumstances were right, readily kick Batman's ass in a one-on-one battle. You know, no, none of the other regular Batman villains could do that. I mean, once Batman gets his hands on Scarecrow or the Riddler, fight's over. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Bane is a whole different prospect. Why you would want to replace him, you know, and then replace him with a female character? Nothing against females. I made my bones writing strong female characters in comics. You know, Valkyrie, uh, Birds of Prey. You know, characters like that. And I love strong female characters. But, you know, it's a little ridiculous sometimes. Uh, well, they also changed Bane's backstory. Now he's like the... Uh, what's what's the name of the island he's from? Uh, Santa Prisca. He's like the national treasure of Santa Prisca. That he's like... Uh, the entire island celebrates him as a national hero. <laughs> and they cloned... <laughs> Bane created Vengeance, so Vengeance is actually a female clone, and and uh, but they didn't want her to have her own like personality, so they she's been like trained since the day she was cloned to finish Bane's mission, to be the new like symbol of excellence of Santa Prisca. I was like, where did this come from? Because I've read this comic and that was not in there. So she has no will of her own. She's just no. Well, that's that's yes. that's exciting. Uh, well, this is the exciting part is she she kidnaps Gordon because she wants to go kill Joker. That's what the, the government has sent her out to go kill Joker because he killed Bane in Arkham Asylum. But she doesn't want to do it because she was programmed. So she wants Jim Gordon to tell all the bad things Joker did to him. So she'll be motivated and can think that she did it of her own free will. It's really stupid. That's convoluted. That's that's yes. that's what we call feathery motivations. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's just like sort of made up to serve the story, but doesn't yes. seem real or organic or anything else. And also, 
can you clone a male and get a female on the other end? And if you could, why would you want to clone a male and get a female if what you wanted was an ass kicker? Uh, I don't well, know. Well, she's still on veg or she's still on venom. And she's, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I see her rip a lady's arm off and chuck at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, I, I liked where Graham and I were taking Bane, that he was going to be basically the lord of DC's underworld. You know, he was going to be the crime kingpin of the planet. Because to me, the thing about Bane is he's a holy shit character. And I never thought I'd create a holy shit character. But, you know, he's the character when he shows up, you go, holy shit. If it's in a comic or in a game or whatever else, go, okay, now it's going to get real. You know, it's like it's like when I was a kid, Doctor Doom would show up. It's like, okay, it's on now. Doctor Doom's here. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not you know the Melter, some other B level character. This is this is it. This is important, and you know that's who Bane is, and why you would get rid of him. Of course, he'll be back, but but why you get rid of him and replace him with a you know a different version just for the hell of it. I mean, if if Dan the Dio were still there, I would think they did it just so that. To, you know, to cut into Graham and my royalties, but <laughs> <laughs> that is a theory that's going around is one of the reasons because they've essentially, uh, you know, Clark Kent has gone to War World, John Kent is the new Superman on Earth, Bruce Wayne is going to vacate Gotham, so Jace Fox will be the new Batman in Gotham, Arthur Curry is retiring to be a stay at home dad, so Jackson Hyde is ascending up to be the new Aquaman. Uh, so they're, they're changing out like kind of all the major players as far as the the Justice League. Hal Jordan, he might still have powers, but the two main Green Lanterns with powers right now are Teen right. Lantern and Jojo Mullins. And so they're replacing out kind of all those, the standard bears with new, uh, more diverse, younger characters. Well, I mean, DC did that in the 90s with Green Lantern, Flash, and Green Arrow. But their reasoning was sound because they wanted younger versions so that a new generation of readers would go, this is my Green Lantern. You know, Kyle Rayner is my Green Lantern. Hal Jordan mm -hmm. is my dad's Green Lantern. That, that made perfect sense. And it me. worked. Yeah, it worked. But that they, were, they the, were dead. But the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they were the B-level characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't do that with the, the icon characters. I mean, are they going to switch out Wonder Woman too? Well, uh, she was in Valhalla while her mother was the Wonder Woman on the Justice League and Nubia was elected as the new queen of the Amazons and Yara Flor was Wonder Woman in training in Brazil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it up, Chuck. I, I remember in Green Arrow I did a crossover or I had guests from the JLA and I wanted Wonder Woman. And they said, well, she's not in the JLA anymore. I was like, what? Well, her mom is. I was like, it's not the same. <laughs> Hippolytus doesn't have the same ring to it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's just not. It's not. It's not Wonder Woman. It's like, and why? And why? Why would you? I mean, that's 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 the thing they would always do. They would reintroduce the Justice League. They bring them back, and it's it's the Magnificent Seven. It's the top seven characters are in the J JLA, and the sales are always great when they bring it back. And then they begin to take those characters Man, away and them replace out. them with other ones, and the sales go down. They're like, oh, well, nobody likes the JLA anymore. It's like, <laughs> how stupid are is. you? They want the <laughs> seven characters together. They want to see those characters together. They don't want to see Gypsy. <laughs> or some other there's thing a, you've invented. <laughs> a recent issue of Justice League, I think it was either issue number one or two, and Green Lantern is in there, and they're talking about whether they sh should accept I think it's, uh, was it Black Adam or Naomi? I think it's Naomi onto the team. And Green Lantern, or not Green Lantern, Green Arrow is telling uh, Batman, we need new points of view in the Justice League. We are all, we've been together for so long that we don't have dissenting voices anymore. And I went and looked and I was like, there have been 140 members of the Justice League. Get out of here that you only had one set of voices. Like this team changes over constantly. And, and certainly you had dissent. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, you have so many different points of view and different missions kind of uh, colliding, and that's what's right. that's why it's fun because you get that interpersonal conflict that gets resol with the resolution as you're fighting the villain. Well, that's the together. secret to an ensemble book, you know, the internal conflict that doesn't make sense. You know, that that's what makes it interesting. 
you know, when they're all complacent and sort of going along with each other, it's like, oh, God, why am I reading this? You yeah, know, like unless, last- unless you have a tremendously clever threat that brings them all together, which, you know, which like I Christopher, prefer. So. Christopher Priest had the, the Watchtower land in Africa where there's a civil war going on. It was, I think it's the last story arc that he did. And they're the basically the Justice League get divided. Should we intervene in the civil war and try to help these people, or should we let them fight their civil war because this isn't our nation? Right. They should be able to settle things among themselves. Right. I was like, that is smart conflict. Yeah. I think that would divide the team. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting story. We don't have enough good writers like Christopher Priest that actually could work at DC and Marvel anymore. Well, like I said, the word is indifferent. You know, he was never he was never indifferent. Let me yeah. say that. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're kind of wrapping up here. I do have one final kind of question sure. that I want to ask. So obviously, I, I've mentioned I'm a big Dick Grayson fan. Should he be? Should he end up with Barbara Gordon or Starfire? Well, I'm going to lean toward Barbara Gordon because I'm the one that kind of got that going. <laughs> Started that, yeah. Yeah, it, it just seemed like a natural fit for one another. And then and, and there's more of a um, what they call a love rack with the two of them. There's more. There's there's stuff that draws them together, and there's stuff that draws them apart, and that makes for an interesting relationship. Whereas with Starfire, it's just you know Romeo and Juliet that just devoted to each other, and that's boring. Well, with I am not Starfire, they might have uh, poisoned the well with that. <laughs> well, that well yeah, that's. <laughs> that you want to be the big that, reveal that, to be the Dick Grayson's the father? That poor character. Uh, <laughs> Starfire is just the most malign character because I always got crap for not using her a lot in Nightwing. Why does she ever appear? And it's like, well, you don't understand what was going on behind the scenes. Um, Denny O'Neill fought for years to get Nightwing back into the Batman camp, out of the Teen Titans camp, back into the Batman camp. And once we got in there, we just weren't going to reference Teen Titans anymore. You just had to cut it? Like, nope. Cut it. Cut that umbilical cord. And, and uh, that those were the editorial directives. It's like it wasn't my choice not to have Starfire show up in Nightwing. It's that that's just the way it was. It was this internecine political battle inside of DC Comics so for, had, like, for, for the for the soul of politicking kept them apart. It is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, yeah, the seriously. two houses. <laughs> <laughs> she was for the House of Teen Titans, and he was right. for the House of Batman. They weren't right. allowed to to uh, date anymore. Yeah, you had to go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss I miss Teen Titans. We just don't... They let all their, their hero books, or their team books just die. Like the Legion, Legion of Superheroes and Teen Titans are just nothing anymore. It's a shame because, I mean, there's so much love for Teen Titans like amongst, you know, my my youngest son's generation because of the cartoons. They, they love those characters. And Well, uh, my sons, they, they've grown up on... Teen Titans Go. They know all the yeah. characters. Now, that's not exactly a comic book show. Right. It's more kind of like random weirdness. It's actually kind sure. of funny. Sure. But it, that is an entryway into a Teen Titans comic book. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so, you know, it's they're they're wasting a franchise there by not having that around. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's crazy. So you're on the Barbara Gordon train. There you go, folks. Chuck Dixon, one of the greatest Batman writers of all time. Well, the definitive voices behind Nightwing says it's Barbara Gordon, and that's the way it should be. Yes, it is. Oh, man, I'm going to get some crap from the people. That, this yes, this is at the end of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> All right, Chuck. So if people want to support your work, you're obviously uh, not. I don't know that you're you're allowed to work at DC and Marvel anymore, but you are still in point. I know you've still got an Indiegogo up there with uh, Brett R. Smith. And you've got some other projects in the fire. Where, where can they find your work now? Uh, if you go to arkhaven.com, uh, that's Ark like Noah's Ark. Uh, I, I'm working on a, a whole bunch of different series for something called Arc Tunes. Arc Tunes is a free, high res digital comics channel. When I say high res, you can read these comics on your big screen in your den, uh, and they'll come up crystal clear. And there's dozens and dozens of titles there. It's free. Uh, and I'm doing a bunch of series there. One of them is My Sister Suprema. It's a superhero thing. Avalon, another superhero thing. Uh, a science fiction thing called Something Big. And a sort of retro 60s monster thing called Go Monster Go. 
and there's new episodes weekly, and uh, it's free. I, I, I emphasize it's free. Go check it out. I know there's going to be something on Arctunes that uh, that you're going to like. Very exciting stuff. I do want to say thank you very much for joining me. Hopefully, we can have another conversation about comics because I definitely want to talk to you about more things than just Batman. No, absolutely, Wes. This was fun. This was fun. I, I enjoyed this, and yeah, let, have me on as a regular. Absolutely. Uh, definitely let Chuck know that you want him back in the comments section, and uh, hopefully he'll be able to get back to you, and uh, I do appreciate that, and uh, that'll be it. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Okay, thank you.